Good morning, everybody, to those in the room and also to those joining us virtually. I'm Mark Spiegler, Global Director of Art Basel, and I'm very happy to stand here on stage with two people with whom I've had a lot of interesting interactions over the years, uh, to people whose fan, who, of whose work I'm, I'm a great fan. Um, we are kicking off today the conversation series, and as always, we started with a conversation with an artist. Um, the artist is Jeffrey Gibson. Um, I had the pleasure uh, during my first trip back to the United States in, in more than a year of visiting um, with me and my kids at his studio. We had a, we had a, great, a great visit and he has a, an amazing former schoolhouse that happens to be only five miles from my mother's home. Um, so we had, a, we had a great upstate moment, uh, but I've been a fan of Jeffrey's work since long before I had met him, which was just then. Um, he fuses a lot of different things in his work. Um, he's from the South originally, but he's lived in Europe, uh, all over America, in Asia as well. Um, he draws strongly on his uh, Native American ex experience, you know, coming from the of Choctaw and Cherokee heritage. But he also mixes in a lot of more urban elements, cl club culture, um, fashion, politics, as well as literature, art history, and queer theory. Um, so it's a really wide-ranging set of references, and I think it's, it's I saw a new work of his um, uh, just recently in, in the halls, just yesterday or a couple of days ago, where you started to mix in photography as well. So that was an interesting dimension, which I didn't even notice when I was in your studio. Um, moderating this discussion is Anne Elgood, uh, who I think I met maybe 12 or 15 years ago at the Venice Biennial through a mutual friend. She's now the director of the ICA in Los Angeles. Um, and this is just the beginning of a whole series of panels. Um, we have 10 panels this year uh, with 36 total speakers. At three o'clock today, we tackle the question of whether institutions need to reinvent themselves now in order to meet the current challenges that we face as a society, as an art world. Um, we're pleased there to be joined by um, Johanna Burton of MOCA LA, Isolde Brielmeyer, who just joined the new museum a couple of months ago, um, and Allison Glass from the newly established ICA San Francisco. So these are all people um, coming out of you know, positions uh, who are themselves or their institutions are redefining or defining themselves. Um, other topics which will be coming along include, of course, NFTs, because um, everyone seems to have an opinion and I hope to have an opinion on those, but also questions about pricing transparency within the art world and you know, the, the rise of, of immersive or experiential artworks. Um, this program is put together by a, a very old friend of mine, um, uh, who, when I, who when I first met him was a gallerist, Ed Winkleman, who's somewhere in the audience. There's Ed. Um, Ed and I then worked together uh, in some ways on a, a blog called Art World Salon, which I had to abandon when I became too prominent in the art world, but Ed was nice enough to help carry it forward. Um, now as a private dealer, author, um, and generally a person who has very strong and good takes on how the art world is evolving. Um, we also joined, it was also put together by con our new conversations manager, Emily Butler. Thank you, Emily, for jumping in. Um, like everything involving the pandemic, pandemic it involved a lot of freestyling um, and, and, and switching around. Um, all of these talks are available online. So, you know, for those of you in the room, thanks for coming. If there's a talk that you miss, you can always watch it, you know, later. And for the online audience, you know, um, we wish you were here. Uh, the weather is great, um, but the conversation will be just as great regardless of where you watch it. And on that note, I will get the hell off stage and let these people do their thing. And Jeffrey, thank you so much, and thank you so much to you for coming. Hello, oh, it's working. Thanks, Mark. I just wanna say what an honor it is to be here. I think, you know, with the pandemic and all of us getting out in the world again, there are certain people in your life that you are really, you really miss and wanna see again, and the sooner the better. So when Jeff invited me to do this conversation, I was tickled because I've, I've, I'm just really happy to see you. <laughs> so here we are. Any opening remarks before I start drilling you with questions? No, I'm, I'm good, drill, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> and here we go. Um, I will also say that the images that you're seeing are 2012 and forward. So we are starting um, to look at the images at a, a really important moment in Jeff's career where he made, I think, really 
um, meaningful shift in his practice. And so we'll talk about that, but that's the images that you're seeing are, are starting, nothing earlier than that, right, Jeff? No, but they're, they're actually totally random. So yeah, they're not in order. Yeah, there's no chronology, <laughs> chron chronology to what you're looking at. So um, I hope you don't mind making you go a little far back to your childhood. Would you mind telling us a little bit about how you grew up? Um, and also, at what point you started thinking about wanting to be an artist and what that kind of meant to you at a younger age and whether that was something that you felt was welcomed by your family or, or a, a kind of life path that your family would have understood and encouraged? Um, well, I was born in Colorado Springs and then my dad, because he was in the, he's a civil engineer with the government during his career, so we moved around about every two or three years. And so we went to North Carolina, New Jersey, Korea, Germany, a few different places in Germany, and then Maryland. Then I went to school in DC, Chicago, London, before moving to New York. Um, so I think for me, I think maybe it was just because it was mobile, you know, to be able to draw and paint. And also traveling around. I know my parents always took us to museums and. I was explaining to someone the other day, I always had uh, posters on my wall of different, from museums. Yeah, and um, I think it just made me feel like I was part of, uh, there, there's just certain places where I really love living and other places where you're kind of like, oh, this sucks. And so there's something about the art world and imagining this kind of expansive um, and in my imagination, boundless world that kind of those posters I think represented. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so I think uh, by the time I was in high school, I identified as like the art art student, and um, which is kind of a rare thing, I think, for teachers. So they glom onto you and let you do whatever you want to do and have as much clay as you want, as much paper as you want. So I was that student. And I think my parents were always um, supportive. I think when it came into question was maybe when it was time to make a decision about college because I didn't really have any models as to like what that meant to be an artist. And I um, actually got kicked out of my first year of college, which was at the University of Maryland. And I went in studying um, anthropology, archeology, span psychology, and maybe my fourth major was painting. So clearly I didn't know <laughs> what that was supposed to be about. And, um, and so I was asked not to return at the end of that year. And I went to a community college just to kind of prove to my father and myself that I did have some idea of what I wanted to do. And then I was in the studios all the time. And it was a professor there who directed me to go to the Art Institute of Chicago. And then it was my friend, Sana Mokujaro, who some of you might know, artist, um, who was on my program in Chicago, who suggested I go to London. And then, and then yeah, I think I always imagined I would live in New York one day. So as I mentioned earlier, we're starting in 2012, but it was in 2010 or so that you considered giving up making art altogether. And can you tell us a little bit about the work you were making at the time and what you now think in retrospect you were feeling disconnected to or what it was that caused you to take a pause? Yeah, even in undergrad at the, univers at, sorry, at the Art Institute of Chicago, you know, I was making abstract work, um, which was about landscape, it was about hunting, it was about indigenous people and basketry and weaving. Um, the movie Pocahontas had come out, so there was a lot of like references to these hybrid creatures of Pocahontas with the bird, with the animals, and they were flying around and getting shot at. <laughs> and, um, and I just remember my professors, and this isn't necessarily a criticism of them, but we're always like, we just don't know how to make sense of all of these references that you're pulling together. Like, how do they how do they come together? And that was always the critique. And I think that continued when I finished grad school and I came to New York. My love is actually abstraction. Um, and that doesn't disregard image or text, obviously. But, um, but so I think when I was indulging in just pure gestural abstraction, but I would speak about it in these ways of having cultural narratives or cultural specificity to it. People just couldn't grasp, like, how do we put these together? So the audience that was really drawn to my work was really into the formal qualities of the work. And that was really um, disappointing to me and kind of made it not worth 
Like I was like, maybe this isn't what I want to do. So I kind of would come back and forth multiple times and um, you know try in the art world, but I just I couldn't figure it out, and it just got so frustrating to the point where I just didn't want to do it anymore. But I obviously still loved making work. So when I left in 2011 to go to San Francisco, I um, kind of took the idea of pursuing a career of an artist out of my mind, and I just was in the studio making paintings. And that, that I think, was a big turning point for me. And from there, I went to France for about six months, and I returned to the show at participant in 2012. So during that time, you also traveled around the US, correct? Like in 2011? Was that before you went to France? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was uh, 20, uh, 2010, maybe I went. I was, it was in multiple trips. A few different trips. Yeah. And what, what the inspiration to, to make those trips and to, and to connect also feels like it was a core part of it. So you were, mm -hmm. you know, I think I've heard you say something like, you wanted to get rid of the idea of the, the singular artist in the studio modality and move toward yeah. something that was more community-based, but, but perhaps at the moment you didn't know what that meant exactly. So you kind of went yeah. on a research trip, really. It was, yeah, they were totally research trips. And I, um, I don't think I really knew, well, basically I was collecting at the time things like auction catalogs um, and books that were ethnographic books, um, and I would make collages from them and cut them out, and then one day I realized, I was like, well, this is wrong, because I'm not connecting with anything that I'm throwing into a collage. And um, so I thought, I have this opportunity that I could go and meet people, like I don't have to look in books. Mm -hmm. And so I left my studio in Brooklyn, and I went traveling to, um, to well, I worked with somebody in Oregon, I worked with somebody in South Dakota, Oklahoma, and there's a Winnipeg, um, and I would basically show up, I had a contact, and I would ask them to reach out to local artisans and artists. And a lot of the people didn't identify as artists, but more as like just people who made things for their communities. And they were all indigenous. All indigenous. And um, so I would go and hang out with them. Um, we did make videos of almost every conversation we did. And, um, and it was really, it was pretty magical, you know, because I think you're sitting there and I'm in someone's home and everybody's so generous, they're like making you food, they're singing songs to you, they're like praying with you, they're giving you gifts. Um, and it just kind of left Brooklyn feeling quite flat. You know, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so much more um, amazing and, and engaging than sitting in my studio cutting up <laughs> book pages. And um, so that, and then there was also just the philosophies, their perspectives on why they were making, which, you know, is no low bar. They're like, I make to like, for my, tr for my culture to survive. I was like, that's a big difference of a reason to make work. Um, or, you know, I make to speak to ancestors, to speak to history, to, um, to honor people. And these are ways that like, I don't, I don't, I didn't actually ever hear anyone talking about their work that way in grad school, in undergrad, with the artists who I had met in Brooklyn. So it wasn't so much like a comparison as much as me just coming back and going like, I prefer that, mm -hmm. you know, and how do I bring more of that into my life? And when you would spend time with these artists, would you also learn actual techniques from them or were you more observing and later you approach some of them to collaborate with you on particular objects? Well, one of the biggest revealing things was that for a lot of, like for, um, South Dakota, for instance, I heard multiple times um, I don't make anything that's going to cost more than $35 for someone to buy. And I was like, oh, why is that? And they were like, well, because no one will buy it. Everyone who comes up to the reservation will spend that. That's the cap. And, um, and I was like, oh, my gosh, that's wild. Um, and I had money that I could, I could pay them to make something. Mm -hmm. So I would say, I at the time, I had like $1,500 per person. And that was just sort of like, they were like, I don't know what I would do that would equal $1,500. And in my mind, I was like, there's a million things you could do, right? Like, you're doing these amazing things. So that was one of the most interesting kind of realizations was the economy shift that was culturally specific. You know, so it's like place, it's within the United States. It's, it's like a, it's a, it's a contemporary condition that also has historical, you know, a historical narrative to it. So that, that was really interesting to me. But um, 
Yeah. So I, I would tell them immediately that I want to commission them to do something. And some people would take that as a jumping off point immediately, and other people it took you know, some conversations over a couple of months. So when you came back to New York um, in 2012, you were pretty quickly approached by Leah Cancitano from Participant, and then also Matthew from American Contemporary simultaneously, correct? And so then you, you decided to make a show that was essentially one show in two locations. And some images from that exhibition are scrolling through here. But do you want to talk a little bit about both the, the works that you made for that show and also what that show sort of meant to you in terms of the reception to the work and, and this shift that we've been talking about? Yeah, I had been away out of New York for about two years at that point, and um, my husband and I were living in France in a town, pont and I was working on a show. Matthew and I were communicating through email and sending images, and, you know, Matthew was great. He was just like, he was like, I don't know if I understand everything, but just do whatever you want to do. I'm happy to, and thrilled to show this work. And, um, and some of the things that I had learned while traveling, like working with Hyde, working with textiles, beading, all of that stuff I could do while traveling around. And Leah, who I have so much respect for and had had a ton of respect for by that point for a while, when she wrote me, I was just like, and I was still on the cusp. No one says no to Leah. I was still on the cusp about whether I even really wanted to return to art making. So in my mind, I told myself, okay, this is your last exhibition. Just think of it that way. You never have to do another one after this. And um, I was still communicating with all these people who I had met on the travels, and they were beginning to send stuff back to Brooklyn. And those things were like things like beadwork, some silver work, quilts, um, masks, some, um, some brass work, things like that. And, um, and they were beginning to come in. And so then I was also looking for evidence or like kind of maybe scholarship of mid-century modern Native artists. And Bill Anthes, who teaches at, I believe, Scripps yeah. College, or Pomona, One Claremont. Of the, or <laughs> um, he wrote this book called Modern Natives, which is specifically about this group of painters. And in that book, he mentions um, Indian art of the United States from 1941 at MoMA. And I just thought, how could I have never heard of this exhibition? And um, so I looked at MoMA for their archive, and there's literally like one page. I think there's one review. But it was actually a pretty provocative time in, in American history and global history. But also for indigenous people, you know, there was artists who were not native enough. They were not Western enough. And so um, the curators organized this exhibition where they cleared out all of, all of MoMA and installed all three floors with work from not just these artists, but from multiple nations. And they were presenting it at the time as design for modern living. So obviously that's really questionable, but I think about 19, sorry, when I think about 1941 and that just as a starting point, it could have been really promising, right? Mm -hmm. But it didn't happen because of World War II. Mm -hmm. So once we enter the Cold War, the government, so previous to that, was, was encouraging, um, you know, sort of as the American melting pot, the vision that Native people were staying with other Native people in their communities and that enriched American culture. Once we go into the Cold War, that becomes seen as socialism, and it's an immediate, like, let's get them off the reservation and move them in and urbanize them into the cities. And so that's really, um, and this is like, a, I'm, I'm really abbreviating things here, but that's what eventually leads to relocation acts to like Los Angeles, New York, Minneapolis, Chicago, all of these places. Um, it leads to the community houses that were self-organized to provide, you know, job support, you know, health care, that sort of thing. And that eventually leads to, to the American Indian movement. So it's kind of like, once I was able to string all that together, then it doesn't, these, these kind of references don't seem disparate. They start seeming like inextricably linked and logical, you know. Wow, that's so fascinating and so much to unpack there. Yeah, that's my nutshell, <laughs> nutshell version of it. But. So when, when you started getting these materials from the, the art, artists and artisans you met, did, did you have an agreement with them from the beginning that you might 
alter their object and make it a, a collaborative artwork? Or did you even know what you were going to do with some of that I material? Kinda I kind of did. I didn't alter anything. I told them that it would be incorporated into larger sculptures and that that would be right. at my, my decision and um, that they would be credited for what they made. Mm -hmm. And so those pieces um, would show up at participant. We'd get a box and I'd say, Leah, <laughs> open it up. What is it? And she'd be like, I don't know. It's a gourd mask with a gold tooth. And I was like, oh, yeah. Um, and so that was really... That was kind of how that, how that worked. And then I installed and kind of built the pieces in the gallery space for three weeks. Oh, amazing. So you were, it became your studio. Yeah, I was there every day. And what was the reception to this exhibition? Well, it was kind of wild because people um, just kind of got it right away. I think um, just in terms of like the content, being excited about seeing pieces that were kind of... Uh, comprehensive in terms of the narrative, like you could kind of look at it. Um, <clears throat> so I think that was really exciting, and, I, and I, I don't know, it was, but for me, it was the first time I had ever experienced that, where people were both excited about like the materials, the aesthetics, the histories, and it was like people were engaging in real time, mm -hmm. and that was amazing. And the cultural content that you had been very much wanting to include in the work but somehow wasn't registering for people yeah. previous to that. It, now it was somehow working. Things were coming together. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about craft for a bit. I mean, it's obviously a huge part of your practice and something that's become, I think, so generative. I mean, as you add different kind of techniques and practices to your arsenal. Um, but I want to talk about it more conceptually because, you know, and also what the process and the, the duration of craft engenders. Mm -hmm. So you've talked a lot about craft as a form, of, of a, as a way to focus, almost like a meditation. And you've also likened that process to one that can be healing mm -hmm. or cathartic. So I just would love to talk about that with you, um, if you could elaborate, and maybe it's a nice moment to talk about the punching bags, mm -hmm. which I think both, you know, are so wildly ambitious in terms of their actual craft in the covering of the punching bags with beads, and, you know, the labor that's mm -hmm. so evident in those works. But then, you know, the content of them also is so poignant because I think there's this incredible vulnerability to those while at the same time there's a lot of strength and a lot of aggression. Mm -hmm. So that was way too many questions yeah, no. in one question, but you see where I'm heading. Yeah, well, I'll start with, uh, you, again, when I was doing these travels, it was somebody who was, in fact, everyone who I spoke to was involved in some sort of artistry that involved small repetitive acts, right? And I realized these were also a lot, most of the people who I spoke to certainly had family members or loved ones who dealt with addiction or they themselves had come through a period in their life with addiction. And they talked about how this act of making kind of would, would um, stabilize them, mm -hmm. you know? Them. And thinking about like kind of more theoretical ideas that I had been thinking about for probably at that point, at least a decade. You know, our contemporary culture is very transactional and we rarely, we rarely, we're rarely part of a transaction that actually starts with us and ends with us. We kind of dip in and out through, whether it's through media culture, digital culture, even like an ATM transaction. You know, we don't really know where's, where, what's going on in that box, you know? <laughs> so, so we kind of like um, suspend our disbelief almost as part of how we negotiate through the world a lot. I do. Yeah. And I realize with craft, you know, what's interesting about, a, say, a beaded panel, maybe there's, you know, 3,000 beads in that. Y your body actually has to envision, I have to get this needle through this hole, I have to loop it around, I need it to sit well with the next bead. Um, and then, and if you don't, you take it out and you do it again. And there's something about that 
training your mind to do that, that you get this kind of awareness that you can envision, you can start, you can make, and you can end. And then your complexity is actually just cumulative, right? Putting one bead on is not complicated. Putting on 3,000 beads is not even necessarily complicated. But the complexity of what it means is just a cumulative thing of this simple act. So to me, um, you know, when I was doing all of the bead work, and this is in 2011, I was really also going to a lot of therapy. I was talking about, you know, inequity issues in the art world and how they were impacting me, and I was really angry, and I was felt disconnected in many ways. And um, so I just brushed over that really quickly, but you know what I mean. Um, so, but craft for me at the time was really that. I was like, to sit down and be like, I'm gonna bead from this end of the canvas to that end of the canvas, and then I can be done, you know? Very different than going to the studio and waiting for your muse to hit, you know, <laughs> to be able to assign myself a task and complete it. So then also, most of the people who I met also made their own clothes. A, a lot of them made their own clothes and um, really saw it as a political act of self-defining oneself. You know, and it wasn't just a style, it was like making clothes that identified you, that um, mainly more than anything, maybe identified you as not a consumer, mm. you know? It wasn't even so much a cultural specificity, it was like, I'm not gonna buy clothes made by white people, to be quite honest, mm. is what I was told numerous times. Then you get into textiles, and the difference of, you know, a mass-produced textile versus a hand-woven textile, you know, and. I don't know if you can follow me here, but it's kind of invoking all of these ideas about labor, economy, craft, who has time to do these things, who can afford to do these things. And that's where I think the textile became sort of, um, even just conceptually, the idea of weaving, whether it's weaving ideas, weaving histories, weaving materials, started making sense as a form that could kind of serve to hold all of this stuff together. If that makes sense, yeah. Absolutely. Um, do you think that the the kind of DIY culture of some of the practitioners you were meeting did that have any impact in your decision later to make garment-based works or pieces that actually look like they should be worn, and some of them, in fact, are worn for performance? Or did you ever make that connection? I think. It I think it's part of it for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it also started much earlier, like in clubs, you know, yeah. and that kind of DIY kind of character that you could create and control. Um, I think that's probably where, well, between that and then also as a kid, looking at regalia of dancers. And um, so that it, it's sort of, again, it's kind of these, these kind of cumulative ways of thinking about what you just said. Is the first garment that you made, were they for the sculptures, um, the ancestral sculptures that with the ceramic heads? Was that the first time? The first, those are, I, I, I think of them as like cloaks, but I think the actual first garment is from like a hammer that was made for me. Mm -hmm. And that, okay. was, that was, I think, the first actual, like I'm gonna make a wearable something. That you, you knew you wanted to wear. And I wanted to perform in it, yeah. Okay. Um, let's come back to that because I, I really want to get into performance and where you've been taking that in your practice. But if we can talk about the, the figurative pieces, mm -hmm. um, you all are seeing some of these scroll by. Some are, are sort of smaller scale, almost, you know, figure with particular references that I'd love you to unpack for us. And then there are the more haunting, um, almost you know, ghostly figures mm -hmm. with the regalia outfits on that I, that I also really want to get into. I love those. But maybe begin with the smaller scale, often covered um, in beadwork or mm -hmm. jingles or other materials. So maybe tell us also, if you don't mind, a little bit about the specific materials and yeah. where they're drawn from. Yeah. Um, so if, if, you've, if you've never been to a powwow, there is a section of the powwow which is all vendors and they sell everything from furs to hides beads fringe jingles they sell all sorts of stuff anything that that, that a dancer might be interested in for making their own regalia they're gonna they're gonna sell it there and it's also a place where 
it's, it's, it's its own micro economy. So a lot of the materials, there's no reason in the world why they're gonna, you know, you would find them elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And Jingles is a great example of that. But, um, so that's where it started from. You know, I thought, what if, rather than going to like, at the time I was going to Canal Street <laughs> to get art materials, I was like, what if I looked at this vendor section of the powwow as like an art supply store? And also give myself permission to sort of play with these materials. Um, because my interest wasn't so much in reflecting the powwow, my interest is in reflecting this idea of this kind of micro economy that is actually sustained by this community of people who come together for very specific reasons. So that's really my interest in those materials. Um, of course, I understand what they signify to them. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm sorry, I got lost in the question there. Oh, I keep waiting oh, for figures. one of the figures, the figures to pop up and then we can pause. Well, with the figures, um, you know, it's kind of interesting. I think that the way that Native histories have been written, and when you put that in combination with um, government policy about how we are defined, quantified, identified, um, those policies work to separate us in many ways. They, um, they posit us against each other in many ways. Um, there's a, there's, here's one here, but there's a oh, competitiveness. Can we stop here? And I think when it comes to aesthetics and materials within different um, cultural regalia, garments, you know, it's, it's sort of like I'm really drawn and have always been drawn, less so now, but to an intertribal aesthetic, which is, you know, sort of in the time period that I grew up is what you would see. So it's not like you had to be from one part of the country to do a certain kind of dance, to use a certain material. It was at a time when, you know, this is post relocation, this is post, um, you know, people being removed from their lands. This is mid century forward of people just struggling to try to create a community. So it meant that we, it, it couldn't be I'm different from you because I'm Choctaw. It's like everyone came together. And so that's the aesthetic that I'm most drawn to. And in the figures, I think um, I try to really forcefully mix up those materials um, in a way to kind of continue that, maybe, mm -hmm. to continue that so it doesn't head into the direction of proprietary kind of exclusive use of, but hopefully an encouragement of um, innovation, which I think is literally why many Native cultures have survived. Mm -hmm. You know, adaptability, innovation, creativity, and authorship, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that um, that's one thing that I know that I had to fight for personally in my mind was this idea that it's like, oh no, you can author from your experience. This isn't, you're not writing a thesis paper about history. You're an artist and you can actually author from your experience subjectively and from your imagination and from your fantasy. That's a very different way of creating, right? Absolutely. Do, do you, did you find the powwow as a kind of cultural experience to be fundamentally intertribal as well? I mean, what, that seems like it was so inspirational to you in part because of this economy you're describing. But was it a space where it felt like some of those delineations were less relevant than other indigenous spaces? I think it's changed a lot since I was a kid. You know, I mean, I was probably going when I was in the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. And then when I started moving around for like college and stuff, I would usually find, you know, befriend like local native people in the community and they would take me to powwows. And so they would introduce me to their communities that way. I think over time, you know, things that, um, like the ideas of like what something becoming ceremonial or something becoming sacred, it was interesting to see that begin to happen within powwows because those, in my history at least, were always separate. So we had family members who continued to practice ceremony and we had family members who, quite frankly, became Christian and saw really traditional practices as, you know, I don't know, unchristian, I suppose, you know. Um, <laughs> And uh, so there was splits between the family. Mm -hmm. And then sort of, as you get into the late 90s, things started kind of mixing up again. And now I would say, you know, I think there's a, there's a lot more specificity within powwows oh, um, that I'm in support of, for sure. But then you bring in, like, queer and trans powwows, and that adds a whole nother <laughs> spin to everything. Wow, absolutely. So... 
you know, I, I think that this commitment that you've made in the work to what you describe as intertribal is so important and, and it really drives the work. I am curious, are there ever specific references to either Cherokee or Choctaw in the work that you pull in? Or do you in some ways kind of avoid that because of this intertribal I'll tell approach? you the reason I avoid it is because I think that it is um, sabotaging. To, to, to look at myself in third person or to look at my family as an observer, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Like, so when I look at my family, I don't think those are Choctaw people. I think that's my grandmother, that's my grandfather. This, okay. is, they, this is what they did, this is what they cook, this is what they eat, this is what their homes look like. I think when we start using tribal identifications as qualifiers, mm -hmm. um, especially if I was ever gonna get rewarded for that comparison in any way, the encouragement would literally give me kind of like a personality disorder. I mean, it's the nature of schizophrenia, right? To have to like be in your body and then to have to look at your body as a performance for other people. So I think my reason for not doing that is really sanity. Mm -hmm. It's because I, was, I, I remember specifically thinking I was like, you know, some people's stories aren't for me to sell, they're not for me to talk about, they're not, they're not mine, you know? So I really do believe that it's like you, the only thing you can be totally honest about, you know, is just your own, your own story. Right, your own experience. Yeah. Um, so let's elaborate on this a bit because, you know, you've talked about how in the culture we live in currently, you know, you're always going to be identified as a person of color. If people don't know your background, they'll speculate. Yeah. You know, is he Puerto Rican? Right. Is he, you know? And so, in a way, you, you are very transparent about your heritage um, and your identity as a way to just put it out there. And yet, of course, it's also, you know, it's who you are and it's visible in the work. And maybe just talk a bit more about... Um, how you think about that and how you think about, um, you know, how, your, how you, your work is perceived because of your identity and that the sort of tension, the back and forth around that for you. I mean, I've said in the past, and I, just, I still really believe this, you know, your identity is sort of like 50% what you think you are and then 50% of what other people think you are. And it's the marriage of those things that's the truth or, you know, however we want to think about what that is. And um, so I think my, you know, identifying with these kind of terms of like, you know, queer, gay, uh, Choctaw, Cherokee, Native American, indigenous, all of that, it's more of an acceptance of like, this is the culture we live in. Like, this is the currency that I have to work with. Mm -hmm. You know, I think in my mind by this point, I have grown beyond that. And I can't imagine a day when maybe that's not how we look at each other. You know, maybe I don't look at, and, and, and part of, that's one of the reasons why I'm really excited about like gender identification, because I feel like it's such a huge cultural shift that actually opens up for so much positivity. But I think, um, yeah, for me with those terms, it's really sort of like, I have to say BIPOC makes my skin crawl. I just think it's not an attractive word. But, but I'm like, I get what it means. I get the intentions. I get the currency of it, the value of it. But um, within Native American cultures, you know, I would say the goal, the dream, is that people here, people not just here, but I mean in the world, would realize the specificity of the hundreds of tribal nations that there are and would give space for those, those identities to really exist and thrive with recognition. Because to, to group us all into one or three terms is it's awful. You know, that, that's erasure. That is erasure, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, this is such a huge subject. We could talk about it all afternoon. <laughs> um, and maybe we can come back to it a bit or if we have time for questions as well. I do want to get to a couple other things. Um, the, the figurative pieces we were talking about a minute ago, um, the ones that have the Mississippi head pots and then the regalia, and they're often... The, the body is often like a tree limb. Um, I'm just so drawn to those pieces. They're so haunting. 
And I, I read you talking about how you started those works because of dreams you were having and dreams in which you ancestors were visiting you and maybe giving you advice. I'm not sure you can let I us know. So. I think so, yeah. <laughs> okay, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think a lot of artists, and I'm assuming we have artists here in the room, but you know, you, you would never like, publicly talk to a curator about, about your dreams. spiritual beliefs and your dreams and who spoke to you in your dreams. But artists would talk about those things to each other in their studio. And I finally decided one day, I was just like, I'm just gonna kind of give in to this because there's a lot of risk taking and I mean, risk to me is sort of subjective to me and to all of us, you know, whatever is a risk to you personally. But to cross some of the lines of material use, of material combinations, for me, I didn't always have the answer. So I would pray and I would ask beings living, passed on, grandparents, like you're asking for knowledge, wisdom, answers, direction, protection, um, and it led to this period of me having these dreams where this, I believe it was either one or two figures would visit me regularly and take me on these kind of journeys and they would speak to me but they would never show me their face. And so you didn't know who they were? I don't know who they were. They I, weren't your grandparents? Actually, no, because I thought one was my grandmother and then it, it wasn't. Um, yeah, and, th and then they stopped. Then they stopped. And what were the journeys? Oh my gosh, they were really wild. I remember one, I was brought into like a tent and there was like a, a section of the tent in the beginning where it was, you could hear like a, almost like a feast going on on the other side. And she laid me down on the ground. She said, you need to sleep. And I was like, but I wanna go in the other room. And I feel like I could hear my grandparents in the other room. And she's like, no, no, no. And she would get really stern. And, and, and finally she was like, you need to rest. She was like, because like this is only beginning. She's like, and, and you're gonna need your, your energy. So there was like stuff like that, and um, we were flying a lot. Mm. And but you know, th it's funny because when I worked at the Field Museum, and I was working on Nagpra, and I was handling objects of many individuals who we don't know, you know, who have passed on. But a lot of the tribal delegations who would come in would pray over me, and they would pray to ask for my protection of handling objects. Mm. And um, so I think that kind of for lack of a better word, that kind of stretching of like what do we allow ourselves to feel safe and to believe in kind of started, no, it didn't start there actually. There's other things I can think about that go back. But that was like a big kind of moment of understanding a relationship to objects and making and I guess like how they come together, you know? I, yeah, I don't know if that and makes maybe sense. also something about the the objects themselves as having this very vital oh yeah they're alive they're yeah, alive they they yeah. feel alive and that's true in so much of your work either because of the kind of you know energy that they put off or the fact that you feel that they're meant to be used like the garments they're meant to be interacted with um Let's talk about language, because as everyone's seeing, as we scroll through, language is absolutely integral mm -hmm. to the work. And maybe start with when you started to integrate language into the pieces and why. And um, we can talk also about you know, what these phrases are, where they come from, mm -hmm. and how, y how you feel that they operate in terms of audience. Um, the first piece that had text literally on it was a punching bag from 2013. And well, other than the Everlast bag, which was 2011. Is this the first Everlast bag? That's the first bag? one, yeah. yeah. That's the first one. And that has an old painting in it that you It destroyed. has old paintings and the beadwork is mine. Um, the, uh, the first bag, the first bag was a punching bag and it just says, believe, believe on it. And that was me talking to myself because I was getting, I mean, literally it just seems so crazy to be like, I'm gonna make a punching bag and cover it with beads. I had no idea. I couldn't have told you what it was about. I couldn't have told you. It was like literally coming from like an internal impulse of like, I wanna see these things together. Um, and so um, that was the first one. And then they kind of continued from there. When You know, I think, let me see. So it must have been, I'm coming up around probably in my 30s. And, you know, music has always been a big part of my life. 
growing up moving around, I feel like I've always had soundtracks playing. But in particular, like in late 80s, early 90s, going to tracks in Washington DC, which was like a 30,000 square foot gay nightclub. Um, and I just remember um, that there would always be men particularly who were like as, as old as like 60s and 70s who were there, who were very, very kind to us and not, in, you know, just in a kind way. And I realized as an adult that I was like, oh my gosh, they were losing everybody at that time. And like, I had no idea. I graduated high school in 1990. So I kind of knew about HIV and AIDS as something on the news or something that was kind of, kind of coming up in the public consciousness. But I didn't realize that I was in a space of mourning and in a space of also celebration and in a space of community. I was just going and listening to music and dancing with my friends. And so when I started listening to those lyrics, you hear trauma, you hear anger, you hear uh, speaking to that particular community, you know? And um, there's, uh, I, it's a song by Daje, and it's like, uh, pick me up, won't you pick me up? Somebody pick me up, please pick me up. And we were just dancing like we were living our best life. You know, but really when you listen to the lyrics and you think about the time that it was written, it's, uh, you think about what was going on with the government at the time. Um, yeah, it was, it was, so that kind of made me look back at those lyrics. And then also think about like the pop songs that stick in our head and start questioning, you know, like why do we listen to them again and again and again? And there's some sort of ability for them to be projected upon, you know? So it could be the person that you loved and you lost, it could be, it, which is most of my work, honestly, usually comes back to relationships hovering somewhere around love. Yeah. The way that pop, everybody feels like it was written for them. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like in the, the very earliest use of language, you were almost speaking to yourself. Yeah. And then in the appropriation or quotation of pop songs, you know, one thing that happens, of course, is as a viewer, you, you recognize it. And then maybe you can place it, maybe you can't, but you start to kind of go through that memory bank to try to remember, oh, that's a Prince song. Or, yeah. um, but also I think more and more, you, and maybe with the newer works, you, you are very directly speaking, I think, to the audience or maybe even more specific than that, specific viewers. Would you say that that's true? And, and who do you think you're speaking to? Well, I've tried to start thinking about like um, native audiences, and and you know that includes kind of first and foremost artists, uh, thinkers, writers, you know. Um, but that's that's also sort of like reflective of me. Like I want to be spoken to in that way, you know. And so, um, so I would say that that's kind of where it started. And I, I think I I feel really committed to words, um, and it, it continues to kind of self-evolve and bring up things like translation, like do I work with other languages, do I work with Choctaw, do I work with Cherokee, what does it look like to abstract those things, what does it mean for you know, the audience at Basel not to understand a Cherokee word across a painting, you know, so those are the kind of questions where it kind of evolves. And so it gets more layered in my use of it. Um, so. Also, uh, I've started chopping things up more and looking at more um, kind of, I guess, unique forms of poetry or you know, even like punk lyrics of just like screaming. I'm like, how do you write a word so that it screams? How do you write a word so that it whispers? Like, how do you make, how do you make an image? How do you make it small text? So uh, those are the kind of things that I'm thinking about now. And also just authoring more of my own text, which is hard, that's incredibly hard for me. Oh, that's exciting. Okay, I got the five minute nod. So I'm gonna ask one more question and then maybe we can take one question <laughs> or something. Um, but I do wanna get into performance. So, you know, performance has become a bigger part of your practice and we may have a, a video still in here though we don't have a clip, but you did this amazing video performance called Like a Hammer in which you, you created a regalia garment and you wore it and you performed and you know, it's really a dance. Mm -hmm. And I know that you were inspired by some of the 
tribal dances that are usually performed by women. And it just really struck me in that piece that you are performing um, both in terms of your identity as an indigenous person, but you're also really interrogating gender in that work and a kind of gender fluidity that you embrace. Um, we could go even further to say that you also are embodying the movements of animals, so there's a kind of hybridity, which I know is something you're interested in, in within the performance itself. So maybe you could just talk for a minute about your, your being pulled toward performance, both for yourself and others that you're inviting to perform, and the role that you think that performance is playing in the work now and where you might take it. I mean, performance right now is it's 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 accomplishing a few things for me. One, I get to physically engage with a community. So, like, if I if I move into a space, there are communities there that we can call forward with specificity, you know, and and we're calling them forward because of who they are, you know. So, like, our calls are oftentimes for people who identify as Indigenous, First Nation, uh, you know, people of color, queer, trans, and um, and then. And that's about an image, you know, in those performances. It's like, I want to see brown arms and legs, and I want to see different kinds of hair, and I want it, it's, it's, I remember it probably when I was in college, and somebody was saying, when you're casting something, like, whoever you cast, it's not just about what they bring to the table in terms of the performance, but you're, you're casting their image, you know, and how important that is. Um, yeah, I feel like I don't really have time to answer the whole question, but the, the, the animal part is interesting because that's actually coming back now. But a lot of the Choctaw social dances um, are based on the movements of animals. And so I was just thinking about animals as teachers mm -hmm. and thinking about their movements. So the phrases are sort of like, um, flirt like a fox. And, and, and literally the movements were just like, what does that mean? Yeah. Like if, <laughs> if your ancestor whispers in your ear like, okay, now's the time to flirt like a fox. <laughs> you know, and you're like, I have this tail <laughs> suddenly, you know. And so, it's sort of like, and then it's also playful, because it is just sort of like, you know, the kind of stoicism of the native persona in the 19th and 20th century, and that's obviously a much huger conversation. But to break that by being like, I have a tail, you know, I have claws, like I have a snout, like I have ears, like that shifts everything. I guess I should, I'm gonna stop there. That's a yeah. nice ending. Emily, do we have time to take a question or two? Okay. Anyone have a question for Jeff? Okay, in the back. I can't wait to work on my flirting with a fox or like a fox. I'm so excited. <laughs> That's fun. I'm going to work on it later. Um, so would you say there's a sense of humor in your work at all? Because you just said that, and that made me think about what you do. Like, do you take yourself seriously, or do you do it with humor? And how is that reflective in your artwork? Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think, I think again, like, there's so much uh, humor within Native communities. Like, you know, when we talk about, like, I remember all the laughter growing up. And again, it's real. It existed, but it's not part of the the public perception of indigenous people. You know, you don't think, oh my gosh, native people are hilarious, you know? <laughs> and so, but it is, it, there's, it, there's a kind of humor, which is sort of like, it's like around the fire and it kind of gets passed around and there's this cleverness to being able to pick up a thread and continue it, you know? So that's what I remember. So I am really interested in it. And I would say in my work, um, I would say I'm becoming more serious about humor um, I tried to teach a class one time about how to write a joke. That is a hard thing, and it's a hard 15 weeks to get through because I don't I don't know how to write a joke. But yeah. So. Anyone else? Okay, one more. Oh, this way. Uh, I was wondering, do the lyrics and the words, do those come to you first and then you decide or envision the color that it's going to be, like the color of the words, the style of the words? I know you got into it a little bit, but yeah. I think it's amazing. I, I mean, Especially this one is so haunting. I yeah. The words are actually really <laughs> difficult, like when you need to find them, you know? So I try to keep like a running list. I have lots of like text messages to myself and emails to myself and documents where I'm writing down words. And then sometimes I'll just 
when, when I need to, you know, really start thinking about work, I'll pull them out and I kind of play around with them and edit them. Um, yeah, and it's funny, sometimes, you know, it just doesn't seem like the right words and then suddenly it, it does. Now that I've been making more paintings, I'm less restricted to kind of like a short character count. You know, when it's in beadwork, you're kind of, you're limited by space. But in paintings, it's kind of amazing. And lately, the thing I've been trying to do is to like my handwriting. For some reason, I grew up hating my handwriting. So, um, yeah, I've just been kind of practicing that, just counter to the, the letter forms that I've been using. Jeff, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we didn't get to this, but Jeff has so many exciting projects coming up. So keep a lookout. He has many shows and wonderful things happening next year and beyond. Thank you. Thanks thank you so, so much. much.